Welcome to Elf Alpha Livestream, sponsored by L4X Seeds. I'm your host, Corey Geiger, editor of Hordes Dairyman and member of the editorial team that produces the Hay and Forage Grower magazine. We are broadcasting from our cheese cave, our studio in downtown Fort Atkinson at the historic W.D. Horde & Sons Company building commissioned by Wisconsin Governor W.D. Horde, who also was a pioneer in alfalfa. And the governor's research into this legume is the main reason the Hordes Dairyman Farm was placed on the National Register of Historic Places by the U.S. Department of Interior back in 1977. I look forward to serving as host for this Alfalfa live stream webcast sponsored by L4X Seeds. Today's presentation will focus on best management practices for stand establishment. All of our presenters will be welcoming questions from our viewers during the final 15 minutes of our hour long webcast. To ask a question, use the GoToMeeting platform and type in the question to the panel. I would first like to welcome Ron Cornish, who you see on the video screen. He is general manager of L4X Seeds. And L4X Seeds and their partners provide ruminant animal producers and commercial hay growers with agronomic support, education, and alfalfa varieties for today's alfalfa growers. Thank you for joining us, Ron. Hey, thank you, Corey. And I want to welcome everybody to Alfalfa Livestream, a webinar series sponsored by L4X Seeds. And this is our fourth and uh, final uh, live stream webinar for now. Um, I hope you've enjoyed these webinars and found them to be informational. And that uh, today, our panelists, uh, like Corey said, are going to be focused on best management practices for stand establishment. And we hope that you find the information practical, uh, you know, things that you, you can take back to your, your own farm and also uh, your customers uh, to to help them establish their alfalfa stands this year. Um, we're very proud to have a network of over 300 dealers and distributors across the U.S. to support the Alpharex Seeds brand. And we know that there are a lot of choices out there when it comes to purchasing alfalfa seed. But we feel that uh, with uh, Alpharex Seeds' focus on alfalfa and other forages, it separates us out from a lot of them. And we also pride ourselves on variety development with our connection back to our parent company, Corteva AgriSciences, who is running one of the world's largest alfalfa breeding programs. So again, thanks for joining us. I hope you uh, enjoy the show here and I'm gonna send it back to Corey and I think we have our first poll question. We absolutely do, Ron. Thank you again. To get us off and rolling on the topic, best management practices for stand establishment, let's go to that poll question. What ground prep do you use before planting alfalfa? No-till, cultivation, then roll pack the seed bed, cultivate, then roll before and after planting, or broadcast seed then roll pack. So go ahead and answer those questions. We'll give you about 20 seconds to do that before introducing our next speaker, Don Miller, who will be turning on his webcam here and joining us live from Napa, Idaho. So we're getting uh, some strong answers here and one category is leading by quite a large margin. So let's go ahead and cut the poll off here. And our top answer is cultivation, then roll pack the seed bed, although second place is rolling before and after seed preparation. And I'd like to welcome our next presenter, Dr. Don Miller. Don is currently Director of Product Development for L4X Seeds and is based out of Napa, Idaho. Don, I look forward to hearing your thoughts on best management practices for alfalfa stand establishment and any comments you might want to make on the poll question our viewers just answered. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, yeah, the, the poll question, I think there's lots of different ways of uh, planting the alfalfa, and, and hopefully uh, by the end of this uh, uh, live stream, you'll have some more ideas on how to get a good stand. But I think uh, there's always a lot of different ways of doing that. So um, as far as my part of the presentation today, I want to cover a little bit on coated seed and uncoated seed. There's always a debate on uh, which is best and uh, if there's any advantage to the coated seed. I also want to talk a little bit about wheel traffic and how it might affect uh, your stand out there in the field. And then a little bit on uh, planting method uh, and some of the things that you need to be aware of. 
Now, there's always a debate on uh, whether uh, coated seed is better than uncoated seed. Is there an advantage? And so, uh, you know, at the end of the day, we're planting a little bit less of the coated seed, uh, actual seed, but uh, does it have better survival? And are you getting the same type of stand with coated? So there is some data here that uh, I'd like to present to give you a little idea of what's been done as far as evaluating that. Uh, as you can see here in this slide, from 1985 to 2014, there's been a steady increase of farmers using coated seed. And so there, there is an advantage, and I think people are starting to see that, uh, uh, and more and more of that coated seed being planted. So coated seed research, the relationship of uh, alfalfa stand establishment to coated and uncoated alfalfa seed. Uh, here's uh, on the next slide is some of the data that's uh, been done to uh, uh, evaluate that. This is a study out of the University of Minnesota that was done a few years ago by Greg Schaefer and Marvin Hall. And uh, they tested uh, at five locations uh, the emergence of treated and untreated alfalfa seed. And from this slide, you can see that all these red numbers show a significant improvement over the untreated seed of the coated over the untreated seed. Uh, they had a spring plant, a fall plant, and uh, I'm sorry, a spring evaluation and a fall evaluation. Uh, the spring evaluation came four weeks after planting. The fall uh, evaluation of the stand came 19 weeks later. They all planted uh, at 15 pounds to the acre. The raw seed was 220,000 seeds per pound. The coated seed was 145,000 seeds per pound. But you can see from this uh, data on this slide that uh, really at the end of the day, the, the coated seed did have better seedling survival and had a good or better stand than the untreated seed. Here's another study from Purdue University. In this trial, uh, they used uh, two different uh, planting uh, uh, rates. Uh, the first trial, trial one, they planted uh, 21.8 pounds of coated seed and 21.8 pounds of uncoated seed. By uh, having a 34% coat, that means we actually had less seeds on the ground, uh, 56 seeds per square foot, and the uncoated seed uh, had 78 seeds per square foot, a difference of 22 seeds between the two, the coated and the uncoated. But at the end of the day, the surviving seedlings, you know, the coated seed was 29.5 seedlings per square foot and the uncoated 30 seedlings per square foot. So at the end of the summer, essentially the same stand, uh, no matter whether you use coated or uncoated seed. They also did a second trial where they reduced the planting rate. Uh, they went down from 21 to 14.5 pounds for the coated and the uncoated. And you can see again, we did have a difference in actual seeds hitting the ground, but at the end of the summer, when we did the seeding uh, per square foot, essentially the coated and the uncoated had uh, almost identical amount of seeds uh, survival. So again, if you are planting coated seed, uh, you don't have to worry about not getting a good stand because uh, it is uh, uh, getting better seedling survival uh, uh, than what uh, you would expect. So in summary, the actual seeding survival was essentially the same, even though the seed count was higher for the uncoated seed. The coated seed was higher to seed seedling success rate than uncoated seed, and that compensates for its lower seed count. So the seed coating advantages, um, there is a cost advantage of planting coated seed, about 40 to 60 cents per pound for the same or better stand. Uh, the seed weight uh, is a little bit heavier with the coated seed, so if you're doing broadcast plantings, that, that is an advantage. And also with the coating, we have a vehicle that we can carry additional benefit additives to on that seed. Dry seed, uh, the coating can pull moisture to the seed. And also with the coating, uh, we can get more rhizobium numbers on that seed, and the survival of the rhizobium is better with that coating. Also, the rate of fungicide per seed is greater with coated seed. We can get more fungicide next to that seed uh, with the coated. So does coating seed uh, uh, influence planting rate calculations? No. Uh, planting same number of pounds of uncoated as coated seed, and at the end of the day, you'll have comparable stands. However, you will need to calibrate your planter if you are switching from uncoated seed to coated seed because the coated seed does flow faster. So the other thing I wanted to talk about is wheel traffic and its effect on your stand. 
uh, a few years ago, we did a study and we found that 40 to 70% of an alfalfa field is run over in a season. So a lot of traffic out there in that alfalfa field. But what we're seeing is that when that traffic occurs out in the field can make a big difference on what damage we're seeing. Wheel traffic itself can cause physical damage to the alfalfa crown, which can reduce the shoots produced and uh, allow entry of diseases. The largest effect of wheel traffic is to break off regrowing alfalfa stems, thereby in reducing the next cutting yield. Breaking shoots that may have started to regrow after cutting has a depleting factor on the stored root carbohydrates. This cartoon here shows uh, essentially what's happening out in the field where that tractor is running over that new growth that's coming up out there in that field. And so it really makes a big difference of when you are running over that field and how much of those uh, new growth uh, root shoots are up and the uh, tires running over those. Here's a photograph showing just how much of a difference there can be. On the left, you have wheel traffic and on the right, uh, no wheel traffic 10 days after uh, the traffic. And you can see that really the plants are responding differently to that traffic. Uh, uh, a lot of damage can occur from that wheel traffic. Here's some data that came out of Wisconsin. It really shows, again, when that wheel traffic is occurring out in the field and the differences that it can make. If you have no uh, wheel traffic, you can see the green bars here, uh, the yields are higher. But uh, if you have traffic at two days, uh, a little bit of reduction, but not as much a reduction in yield as if you ran over that field five days after the initial cut. So again, uh, the timing, uh, if you can get across that field earlier, uh, less damage. If you extend uh, when you're out getting that material off the field and run over it later, you're getting more damage. So I also want to talk a little bit about the planning method. Uh, you know, there's a wide range of planters that can be used to plant alfalfa successfully, inc including grain drills, precision drills, brilliant packer types, airflow spreaders, and no-till drills. If you are planting in rows, be sure to use a planter with press wheels for good seed to soil contact and keep the row spacing relatively narrow to discourage weed competition. And if you are using broadcast plantings, you may need to uh, roll and pack before and after planting and to provide uh, better seed to soil contact, but also increase your seeding rates by 10 to 20 percent if you're broadcasting. Uh, if you are using a grain drill, be sure to, uh, uh, there, you know, it can be used in a lot of uh, different soil conditions, but be sure and check the speed uh, seeding depth of each row of uh, that uh, grain drill. The drills with uh, depth bands will help keep the seed placement at a consistent depth. So again, be aware of that. Another way of uh, reducing some of the weeds that might uh, occur in those open areas in the field is, uh, again, if you can uh, narrow the row spacing or uh, some farmers have actually gone to uh, planting in two directions. And again, that uh, reduces the amount of open space for the weeds to get established and can reduce uh, the weeds out there in that alfalfa field. Well, thanks a bunch, Don. I really appreciate your conversational style. You deliver a lot of information in a very, in a short time, in a very easy to understand format. Thank you. We're gonna go uh, to another poll question. Before we do that, I wanna remind our audience that you can go to the GoToWebinar question panel and type in a question for Don or our next two speakers, Kim and Earl. You can type those in any time in the final portion of the broadcast. We will go ahead and answer those. With that, let's go to our next poll question. And the poll question reads like this. When do you plant alfalfa? Very simple. Spring, late summer, fall, or any time and as we're answering that poll question, we'll have our next presenter go ahead and turn her webcam on and we'll wait for the answers to, to that question. So we're over 60% votes in, so let's go ahead and close the poll off. And the uh, clear winner is spring, but there's some other categories here. Late summer was at 12%, fall 18, and at any time, was 10%. And I know our next speaker will provide a great deal of insight into the timing of alfalfa planting. 
Kim Casada is the Extension Forge and Cover Crop Specialist for Michigan State University with degrees from Penn State and the University of Maine. Her extension program focuses on all things forage and her research program focuses on management of alfalfa, perennial and annual mixtures and the role of forages and cover crops in improving the stability of agro ecosystems. In her spare time, Kim uh, it raises sheep and trial dogs. Kim, I look forward to hearing your thoughts on alfalfa st establishment, site preparation, and seeding date. Thank you, Corey, and it's great to be here on the alfalfa live stream today. We can go ahead to the first slide. <clears throat> Our, our topics today are spread up a little bit amongst the uh, the three speakers, and it occurred to me this morning looking at it that we aren't necessarily in the most logical order, but <laughs> you all can uh, figure that out, I'm, I'm sure. So what I'm really going to be talking about is selecting the most suitable site, which would actually happen before what Don was talking about. Uh, Obviously, alfalfa needs a well-drained site. I think we all know that. Uh, it needs or prefers a deep soil. That's where you really get uh, the best advantage from its deep root system. One thing that we increasingly find that people need to be aware of is uh, to make sure there's no herbicide residual left in the soil from the last uh, crop that was grown there. Uh, some of the Newer herbicides used in particularly soybeans uh, might have a soil residual of 18 months uh, and that could damage your alfalfa. So you need to get uh, or you need to know what's been applied there in the past. We need to make sure there's no alfalfa autotoxicity on the site. We would like the pH to be 6.8 or greater and we need good fertility for phosphorus, potassium, sulfur and boron. I want to talk a little bit about alfalfa autotoxicity. What this slide is showing is a field uh, that was, the whole field was planted at the same time to alfalfa in 2013. The field on the right had been in continuous corn prior to that, while the field on the left had been an alfalfa stand that was terminated in 2011, grew corn in 2012 before it was replanted to the alfalfa. Uh, and I think you can all see the difference in the stand on the two sides of the picture. What is causing this? This is a phenomenon known as uh, alfalfa autotoxicity, which is a form of general plant allelopathy. And basically what's going on is alfalfa produces toxins that are uh, that are deadly to its own seedlings. Uh, it's not going to harm other plants, only its own seedlings. Uh, the reason for this is probably to enhance its survival in its original rather dry environment that it came from. Uh, but what these toxins do is they damage the root of the seedling. Uh, and you can see in the diagram, the one on the left, the roots are much smaller than the normal plant on the right. So the consequences of this when you go to plant your alfalfa is that you might get outright reduced or failed establishment where you don't have any plants at all, or even more sneaky, you might get something called auto suppression or auto conditioning where you actually do have plants, but their roots are damaged, which you can't see, uh, and it may look like you have a, a stand that's doing okay, except for the unknown to you, its lifetime stand productivity um, will be reduced because the plant can never repair that root damage. It can only try and compensate. So this is the reason why we can't thicken an alfalfa stand during its lifetime. And it's also the reason we have a waiting period before we go and try and establish a new stand after termination. Uh, and that waiting period could be anywhere from two weeks to two years. Why don't we know more about how long it will take? The biggest problem with predicting autotoxicity is that we don't actually know exactly what the compound or compounds are that are doing this. So we can't directly measure it. We do know some things about it. We know it's water soluble, it's more concentrated in the leaves, it's concentrated in an eight inch radius around the plant, and the plant contains more of it after it's had a chance to flower. Um, there is also good evidence that alfalfa varieties may differ either in the amount of toxin they produce or in their tolerance to toxin. 
So these make it very difficult to predict what's happening. However, we do know um, that autotoxicity disappears over time. The, the compound is probably broken down in the soil um, through various things. We know that it is leached out by rainfall, so it disappears more rapidly when you have a lot of water. Um, it disappears faster in a sandy soil, and it breaks down faster under tillage than it does, does in a no-till system. And so from this, we just have to go, this is how long we think it will take in a certain environment um, before it would be safe to replant. So once you've picked your site, now you need to think about what's the right planting date to use. Um, Basically, we have two big windows that are that are recommended for alfalfa planting. One is in the spring and one is in what you might call late summer, which might actually be early fall if you're in a southern enough location. But the idea behind the spring planting is that typically we have more water available at that time of year. And it has the advantage of that you might be able to get one to two cuts in the seeding year. Uh, but it has a disadvantage of there being a lot more weeds, insects, and diseases that you have to contend with. So in the upper Midwest, um, we've been able to establish these zones showed in the figure, which comes from the alfalfa management guide uh, that gives you some guidance on where to plant in that part of the country. If you're in other places, and I know we have listeners from all over the country here today, um, the timing of those zones is based on timing planting so that the second trifoliate leaf stage is after the last killing frost date. Um, and that second trifoliate leaf will typically show up two to three weeks after seeding, depending on how fast things are growing. And the reason for this is um, that before that second trifoliate, the alfalfa seedling is pretty tough um, when it comes to cold weather. But after that, um, it is quite susceptible to cold injury if the temperature gets below 26 degrees. The other big opportunity is what I will call the late summer planting. So our advantages here is that we have a lot less weeds and disease options uh, or pressure usually, um, but we have some other disadvantages. So you have an increased risk of drought in most parts of the country. Um, you get no seeding year harvest usually, um, and you have the risk of winter coming early. Um, and the reason that that early winter is a problem is again looking at these zones um, the timing that these are based on this time is six to eight weeks before the first killing frost date so we can know what that is based on your average data for your area but um, if winter comes early you might be surprised the reason that this is so important is shown in the next slide And this is uh, the sequence of alfalfa seedling development. Um, alfalfa has an interesting aspect of seedling growth called contractile growth. So if you look at the stages of seedling development here, you can see that the white part is rep represents the root of the seedling and the green part is the stem. And that junction between stem and root is where the crown is going to eventually develop. We want that crown to be underground. In the early stages of development, it's actually above the ground. And while it's still above ground, it's very susceptible to freezing damage. So it typically is going to take six to eight weeks after planting before the contraction pulls the crown far enough underground um, to protect it from frost. And that's why you need to be sure to plant early enough to let that happen. The next thing I want to talk about is adjusting uh, the pH and fertility on your site. Um, and I can't really overestimate how important it is to try and get this done before you put your seed in the ground, because that's really your best opportunity um, to correct problems and actually be able to use tillage and work the, work the amendments into the ground. <clears throat> Now, I'm not going to try and give you a lot of specific recommendations today because the first thing you need to do, regardless of where you are, is get a soil test and send it in to wherever you get soil tests done 
wherever it is that you live. Um, and this will uh, measure the pH for you. It will also estimate the amount of phosphorus, potassium, calcium, and magnesium that are there for your plants. And most importantly, it will give you recommendations that are specific for your location and your soil type and other criteria that you specify um, for amending lime, phosphate, and potassium. Now, I did in the blue box give you just um, some overall recommendations for what the targets might be for those nutrients. And the key thing I want you to see there is why they're important. Uh, the pH is important for survival of the plant and rhizobia. The phosphorus is important for seedling development. Um, and the potassium is very important to help the plants make it through the winter. The optimum soil pH for alfalfa is 6.8. Uh, you can see in the graph how the uh, dry matter yield in first cutting increases steadily as we get up to that 6.8 mark. Um, and that's a little bit higher than many of our other forage crops. So why is that? This is a classic soil nutrient availability chart. What you're seeing there is uh, the green bars for each nutrient indicate how available that nutrient is in the soil at a particular pH. Um, and that shaded light blue box indicates where we would like alfalfa to be. And you can see for uh, many of our essential nutrients, the wide part of the bar fits with um, where that blue box is and that will optimize uptake. But I want you to also note the two nutrients that are circled in red there, manganese and aluminum. Now manganese is essential to plants in very tiny amounts, but too much of it is toxic. Um, and you can see that as the pH goes down, uh, the availability of manganese goes up. You can also see the same thing happening um, for aluminum. And aluminum is not required in any amount. It's always toxic. Um, and alfalfa is very sensitive to it. And so this aluminum toxicity is the main thing that limits our productivity in um, acid soils. Improving your pH will also make your rhizobia more effective. Um, and it will also increase nutrient mineralization and overall soil health um, due to action of beneficial soil microbes. pH is slow to be corrected. Uh, typically, we'll use ag, ag lime to do this. Ag lime is simply crushed limestone rock, um, and it doesn't work very fast. It takes at least six months to change the pH. Um, so it's important to plan ahead and get this done well before you're going to put the seed in the ground. Um, another thing that will affect it is the grind size of the limestone, which is uh, this carbon calcium carbonate equivalent or CCE, the finer the grind, the faster the lime can work. And that is because the surface area of the lime is where the action is. Uh, as shown in the box here, you'll have the calcium carbonate, which is the limestone in red, um, and it will actually exchange the calcium molecule with the hydrogen that's on clay. The hydrogen is what's causing the low pH. And you then end up with calcium bound to clay and the hydrogen goes into carbonic acid where it's quickly broken down into harmless water and carbon dioxide. Um, and as a consequence of this, once that calcium is off the particle of limestone, uh, it can't do anything more for your pH. So the lime will be exhausted over time and this is why we have to reapply it periodically. I want to say a few things about boron and sulfur, uh, and the reason I'm honing in on them uh, is because your normal soil test doesn't even include these nutrients, and the reason it doesn't include them is because soil testing is not a reliable indicator of the status of these nutrients in soil. Uh, a, soil a plant tissue test is a reliable indicator, but in an establishment situation, you don't have any plants yet, so you can't do a plant tissue test. So you might want to think about um, adjusting boron and sulfur depending on the history of your site. Um, one thing with the boron is you want to make sure not to apply that immediately before seeding uh, because if it comes in direct contact with the seed, it will inhibit germination. But one thing you could do is put it on with your lime six months earlier. That would give it a chance to uh, spread out in the soil, get bound and not be toxic. Or you could put it on um, after you plant. 
as a surface application. Um, and if you're on a sandy, sandy soil, you don't need very much. You only need about 0 0.5 to one pound per acre because too much boron is also toxic. It's kind of like manganese in that regard. On a medium texture soil, you might apply two to three pounds per acre just once during the alfalfa rotation, and it'd be good to do that with your lime so that you have it ready when you start to grow. In the case of sulfur, we're finding uh, increasing areas of the country uh, due to us cleaning up our acid rain situation, which used to provide sulfur, uh, but at least here in Michigan, we're seeing a lot more sulfur deficiency than we used to. Uh, we tend to see it in particular on sandy, low organic matter soils that have high rainfall. Um, so if you're in one of those areas, it might be prudent um, to put on a pre-plant application of 25 to 50 pounds per acre of sulfur. Um, or another condition might be if you're just in an area where people are seeing a response to sulfur. A good source of sulfur alone is uh, gypsum. Uh, it contains about 17% sulfur. It doesn't actually have any impact at all on your soil pH, uh, but it's a great source of sulfur, and it may also contain some boron. And the last thing I want to talk about is whether or not you might consider using some starter nitrogen fertilizer for your alfalfa. Um, putting nitrogen off on alfalfa is not something we usually think about uh, because of course it has rhizobia and it should be able to make its own. But the thing is the rhizobia don't form and provide enough nitrogen for the plant until at least six weeks after germination. And up to that point, the plant just has to pull nitrogen out of the soil like any other plant. Uh, so if you are on a soil with less than 2% organic matter, um, the organic matter is the reservoir for mineralizable nitrogen in a soil. Uh, and so if you don't have much organic matter, you probably won't have much nitrogen either. Um, and in that case, the alfalfa may benefit from a small amount of nitrogen, maybe 30 to 40 pounds per acre to get it started. Um, and that's also very valuable if you're using a nurse crop. But you don't want to put on any more than that because if you give it too much, you will actually inhibit the formation of the rhizobia and, and it will hurt your long-term um, nitrogen fixation. Well, thank you, Kim. Some of these recommendations at the end remind me of the uh, children's book uh, with Goldilocks. <clears throat> I think when you think of boron and manganese and yeah. whether you're going to put in starter nitrogen fertilizer, yeah. you want to put some in, but you don't want to put right. in too much. You want it to it be just right. It needs to be just right. <laughs> so with that, let's go uh, remind our audience here that if you have a question for our panelists, and we have a number of them that came in, please submit that question into the GoToWebinar control panel and just go ahead and type it in and we'll see that here and get it directed to the right uh, presenter in the last 15 minutes of our program. With that, let's go straight to a final poll question. What is your typical seeding rate? Under 10 pounds of alfalfa, 15 pounds of alfalfa, 20 pounds of alfalfa, or 25 plus pounds of alfalfa? So let's give our audience a little bit of time to answer that question, and we'll invite our third presenter coming to us from Utah to turn on his webcam. And I know a number of us watch this uh, web uh, alfalfa live stream here in uh, on our computers, but some also turn it into a podcast and listen audio only. And if that's the case, you're unable to answer the poll question. We got two thirds of the viewers have answered it. So let's go ahead and put that up here. And uh, 20 pounds is our is the answer that the viewers selected more often with a bell-shaped curve around that answer. And let's go ahead and talk best practices for alfalfa stand establishment. Earl Creech, welcome to Alfalfa Livestream. Earl is a professor and extension agronomist at Utah State University. Earl grew up on a family livestock and crop production farm near Logan, Utah, and received his bachelor and master degrees from Utah State University before earning his PhD at Purdue. Then Earl spent the first three years at the University of Nevada, Reno, as the extension weed specialist before accepting his current position at Utah State University. 
In his research and extension efforts, Earl works to address critical agronomic issues facing farmers and ranchers in Utah and throughout the Western US. And that part of the region right now, unfortunately, is uh, embraced uh, by some drought conditions. But today, Earl, I look forward to your presentation, alfalfa planting depth, seeding rates, and herbicides. Earl? Thank you, Corey. And it's, and it's good to be with you all on this uh, alfalfa live stream event. So we're going to talk a little bit more about alfalfa establishment, and we'll start out by talking about planting depth. So anytime that we think about depth of planting, we need to think about the seed bed. And the enemy of an alf a new alfalfa seeding is a fluffy seed bed. And so the, the way that we can tell whether we have a seed bed that's, that's sufficient for planting is by using what we call the rule of boot. And the rule of boot is when we have our seed bed prepared to the level where we think we're good to go, we, we hop out of the tractor and we, we walk on that seed bed with our, with our boots. And if the heel and the sole make an imprint in the soil, but the arch does not, then we know that that seed bed is, is ready for an alfalfa uh, planting. Uh, when when the, the, the arch is making an imprint, we know it's too loose and we probably need to take a, another trip across the field or do something to firm it up. Um, if you ever have questions about whether the, the seed bed is, is firm enough, um, you're probably better off to go a little bit firmer than you, than you think you may need to. It, it can never be too firm. So seeding depth. Uh, the most most um, failures or, or disasters that we see in alfalfa stand establishment are the result of seed being planted too deep. And any plant, any crop that we plant, we typically target planting two and a half to five times the width of the seed in our in depth. And that's our starting point. That's the rule of thumb. And then from that, we adjust either and, and go either uh, shallower or deeper based on soil moisture conditions, the texture of the soil, the, the, the temperature that we're dealing with, the time of year that we're trying to plant, or just simply our experience in, in a particular field or area. And um, oftentimes we'll find ourselves when we're, when, when we're starting to plant and we've, we've, we've drug the drill for a little while and we wanna hop out and, and take a look about, at, at how we're doing and what our depth is and we're digging in the soil and you find the seeds and you think, is this uh, too deep or too shallow? Um, I, think, I think if you ever have that question in your mind, I think you're better to be too shallow than too deep because we can overcome too shallow. Um, planting too shallow can be overcome with, with um, additional irrigation water, with, with, with simply moisture conditions can help bring that. But if we're too deep, um, the seed won't come up no matter what we, what we do. This is a, a, a little dem demonstration in the slide that I got from Dan Putnam from UC Davis. And this was done in the greenhouse where they went in and planted seed at different depths, alfalfa seed at different, different depths and watered it up. And keep in mind that this is, this is going to be optimal conditions for emergence because it was able, they were able to keep it continuously wet. And so over on the right, you'll see a quarter and a half inch deep and you'll see that uh, terrific looking emergence there. By the time you get to the middle and you see one inch, you'll, um, the, the emergence has started to decline. And then by the time you hit two to two and a half inches, you have a complete disaster on your hands and, and none of the seed was able to emerge. But with alfalfa, we typically try to target planting a quarter to a half inch deep. That's where we, that's where we typically want to be. If all of us were to approach our fathers or our grandparent, our grandfathers and ask what seeding rate they used for alfalfa, it's pretty likely that we plant today at a lower seeding rate than they did back in the olden days. And the reason is, is for, well, there's a few reasons for that. First of all, our equipment that we use for planting is, is much more uh, precise than it, than it was in years past. Next, we have better seed technology. So the coatings, the seed treatments that we have are designed to help protect seed 
and, and increase our likelihood that, it, that each individual seed can actually come up and become established. The genetics have, have, have improved leaps and bounds, and there's a lot of emphasis in, in breeding programs placed on um, emergence and, and seedling vigor in and, and, and establishment. And so that, that, that helps to lower our seeding rates. And then finally, it's, it's economically driven. Seed is much more expensive today than it was in years past, and because of that, we try to use less of it. So this is, a, this is some data from a trial we did a few years ago, and it was a, a national trial, at six locations across the US. One of the sites was in Utah, but you can see the other states listed there. And what we were trying to measure was how seeding rate affected persistence and yield and quality of, of uh, alfalfa. So I'm gonna talk about four seeding rates, so six, 10, 14, and 18 pounds per acre. And this is pure live seed. So this is uh, um, not, not including a seed coat, but actual pure live seed. And this is a, a photograph after, after establishment. You see we had um, solid set sprinkler irrigation. We had good conditions for emergence. So we're pretty confident that anything that could have germinated did based on the, the seed bed and, and irrigation conditions that we had. So this is the cumulative yield over the five years of the of the trial. <clears throat> and there's there's a blue part of the bar and a black part of the bar. The blue part of the bar is alfalfa and the black part of the bar is weeds. So at six pounds per acre, you can see that our yield over the life of the stand was reduced compared to any of the other seeding rates, 10 to 18 pounds per acre. And, but there was no difference between planting at 10 pounds or 18 pounds per acre. And so once we hit that 10 pound rate, um, we didn't see any improvement by seeding at a, at a higher rate. Bear in mind, we had perfect seed bed conditions. And, and so we didn't, but, but when you have perfect seed bed conditions, 10 pounds is plenty. The other thing that's kind of interesting about looking at this data is the, the, the contribution of weeds to yield. Sometimes we hear growers say that I, that, that, that I choose to seed at a higher seeding rate for my alfalfa to help suppress weeds. And in this trial, comparing you know, six pounds or even three times that amount at 18 pounds per acre, we didn't see any improvement in weed suppression. And so again, seed at at least 10 pounds per acre and you should be, have sufficient uh, seed there for a stand establishment. And <clears throat> this is the, the density of alfalfa over time. And so in year one, the, the, you can, you can kind of compare the, the six pound uh, seeding rate in the blue bar versus the 18 pound seeding rate in the gold bar. And you'll see that, yeah, in year one, we had more plants per square foot in, in year one at the, the higher seeding rate than we did at the lower seeding rate. And then, but, but then fast forward to the time that we hit year five and they all ended up in about the same place. And this is because alfalfa is a self thinning plant. And eventually it'll, they, as long as you have a, a, a good enough stand to begin with, um, they, they will all end up in, in approximately the same place over time. It's just that the higher seeding rates thin at a faster rate and then, then the lower seeding rate, which, which team tends to be a little bit more, more consistent from year to year. So when should we bump the seeding rate? When should we increase the seeding rate? Well, if we are broadcast seeding, instead of using a drill, we need to plant at a higher rate. And that's usually about 10 to 20% higher seeding rate to make up for the fact that in broadcast, you're going to have some seed left on the on the soil surface, and you're going to also bury some too deep, and some will be just right. And so we 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 kick up the seeding rate for that fact. If we have suboptimal seed bed conditions, the poor seed bed that that and and we're concerned about seed to soil contact, whether it's cloddy, powdery, um, or fluffy, we need to we need to also increase the seeding rate to a to um, compensate for the fact that that we're going to lose some seed based on our, our seed bed. <clears throat> Next is if we have poor equipment, you know, equipment where 
we're, we're burying seed too deep or too shallow or it's uneven across the span of the drill, then, then you'll simply need to increase the seeding rate to account for that. If our soil moisture is variable or poor, we increase seeding rate. Or if, the, or if we have high amounts of residue or variable residue on the soil surface, then we also increase seeding rate. We're, the last thing that we're going to talk about is weed management. And on the left, you'll see a photograph of a field, a new stand of alfalfa, and it has mustard in it. It's a really common weed in new stands of alfalfa. And <clears throat> when we're in, in stand establishment, we can, we can sometimes deal with the fact that we may have a weed patch because we know that after first cutting, we come back in second cutting and the, the field looks, looks like the picture on the right. And the, the, the alfalfa is now competitive, the weeds are gone, and we say, hey, this is great. I save 20 or 30 bucks an acre by not having to apply a herbicide. But is this, a, is, is this actually a problem? So this is a, a, a continuation of the trial we talked about before where we looked at the effect of, of applying a herbicide one time in the establishment year and then looking at the effect of a one-time herbicide application and establishment throughout the life of the stand. So, so in this trial, we compared uh, a Roundup application to a, a, an application of Raptor at five ounces, and then we compared that to a non-created check. So this is what the, the, the herbicide treated plots look like. These were 10 foot by 30 feet uh, in, in size. And we, we had really nice weed control from the herbicides. And this is what the non-treated check looked like. And you can see that we had a healthy population of weeds, mostly lambs, quarters, and some green foxtail. So this is the year one yields. And on the and so on your left, you'll see the the non-treated check was our highest yielding overall, but but about half of the yield was weeds, and the other half was was alfalfa. Uh, next is is Raptor, and and here it, you you can see that we had we had good good weed control with Raptor. It's not perfect, and it's never perfect, but it but it but it substantially reduced the amount of weeds growing there, um, and allowed more alfalfa to grow compared compared to the non-treated check. And then finally, with Roundup treated, there were no weeds in those plots. And the, it was our highest yielding alfalfa um, treatment in, in year one. Now this is where it gets really interesting because in years, this is the average yield over years two through five and we had no weeds present through the, the, the whole rest of the life of the stand. <clears throat> but, what you'll notice is the non-treated check was about a half ton per acre per year, lower yielding than either treatment treated with a herbicide. So it didn't matter what herbicide that we used, as long as we do, did something to, to control the weeds in the, in the first year, and that allowed um, for maximum yield potential in, in the years that, that uh, followed. And I'm a I'm a weed control guy, um, and and I can spend I can spend days talking about herbicides and alfalfa and, and any other crop, but I'm going to use some serious constraint here, and I'm only going to show you this one slide. And and what you will notice what what I've got here are the the herbicides used for alfalfa stand establishment, and on your left are the pre-emergence herbicides that that are commonly used. Um, uh, most of which are post are pre-plant um, uh, pre incorporated. And then on the, on the right side will be your, your post-emergence options. And when it comes to choosing herbicides to, to, to use in your stand establishment, the, the most important things to remember are the crop stage is key. You, we've got to pay attention to the, the size of the alfalfa because alfalfa can be very sensitive to, to these herbicides at uh, different growth stages. And so pay attention to what the label says in terms of when it can be applied. Most of your post-emergence herbicides can be applied at the two to three trifoliate stage, uh, not before that, and, and often not after that. 
Um, weed, identi weed identity is critical because unless you're using Roundup and stand, stand establishment, each of these weeds are good at certain weeds and bad at other weeds. And so we need to match the herbicide to the weed pressure that you have in the field. And then finally, all of these weed, all of these herbicides are small weed herbicides. They do not control weeds bigger than about two to three inches in size. And so we need to be right on top of it so that when the weeds are at the at the at the prime stage for control, that we're out there, we're spraying, and, and then these these products can do a nice job. Thank you, Earl. And we're going to invite Don and Kim to turn their webcams and audio on here. We have a lot of questions that rolled in here, and we're going to go straight to speed round. And a remind the audience, you can go to the GoToWebinar control panel to ask a question. So when I call speed round, that means I'm going to direct the question to one person and ask that they answer it. Don, we're starting with you. Has there been any research done in respects to driving over and damaging alfalfa in terms if it's better to run tractors at wide tires, causing less damage, or if it's better to have narrow tires and reduce the size of the wheel that's uh, the wheel track? So go ahead and take that one. Yeah, there has been some work done on that, uh, but I think the timing of the, the traffic uh, probably has the biggest factor, but yeah, the, the size of the tires, the air pressure, that can also affect compaction out there in that field. But I think the timing, if if you can be, uh, say, uh, two days versus five days on you running across that field uh, after a cut, uh, that makes a big difference. Kim, the next one's coming your way. What do you think about lime application on alfalfa after the first cut? And this audience member says, I'm talking about year two in the establishment of alfalfa. Can you? Does it work at that point? Well, you can certainly apply lime at any time, and, and it has to obviously be applied surface um, after the alfalfa has been established, but it still will take six months for it to do anything. So if you put lime on surface applied after first cut, um, it's not going to help you in that growing season. It may help you the next year, but you can put it on at any time. You just have to keep in mind that six-month window. Um, of opportunity for it to change the pH. To activate and do some work. Right. Earl, next yeah. question for you, and it's in reference to your rule of boot. Would you recommend, uh, how would you recommend firming up a sandy soil? I don't know. That's a, that's a really good question. I, I, I deal with, I, I farm on my, you know, I farm myself. I have a 400 acre farm myself and about half of it is sandy soil. And so I know what you're what you're talking about here. It's it's a blow sand even. Um, I don't know. The the best way to firm it up is with water. With with uh, either if, if you're in an area where you can irrigate, you can give it a quick shot of water, and that'll that that'll that'll help to firm it up. Um, or or if you're in an area that you you can't, you you can wait for some rain. But in general, it's moisture. I mean, that sandy soil can become very hard if you have if you have if you had some moisture, but but tillage, it just seems to never really firm up. Don, next one's coming to you. You talked about coated seeds early in your presentation. Are there coated seeds available in organic alfalfa production? Yes, um, if you are uh, interested in coated seed, there are some uh, uh, organic versions of the coated seed. So yeah, just uh, get with your uh, supplier and they can get you some uh, organic coated seed. Kim, this question came in real early in your presentation and you kind of touched on it, maybe even answered it, but I think we need to reiterate this because it is important. Is there a way to reduce autotoxins or shorten their life so alfalfa can be planted sooner? Well, that is what I was trying to address was saying that tillage is probably our biggest management tool that we have control over. Soil type also affects it. You don't have any control over that. Um, if you are irrigating, you have some control over water application. So we know the more water moves through the soil, the uh, the more uh, the toxin will be moved out. But right now, with our current state of knowledge, our best tool is tillage. Earl, we're coming back to you. You see the rhythm we're doing here. Please address dormant seeding for dry land stands in areas with little summer or fall rainfall. Yeah, so d dormant seeding can be a, a powerful tool in stand establishment, and uh, 
typically with that we try to go in it, it, it it's highly variable on the area and when you receive your when, when you receive your moisture but you'll want to make sure that you put it in place when the the temperatures are so cold that the that the crop can't germinate and and then the moisture comes on top of it and then as the as the temperatures start to warm then then the the alfalfa germinates and 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 grows and and is able to take advantage of every drop of moisture out there and that's the benefit of it that you can you can get it out there early enough that you you don't have to wait for for drying to happen in order to get get on and plant it but but it, it's that when when this is done is is highly variable based on where where you are Earl, we're going to do a real quick follow-up to the answer of your first question that we started out with. So would it be better to irrigate sandy soil before seeding alfalfa or after seeding alfalfa? There, I think it just depends on your um, uh, on the condition of your seed bed. If it, if I, I, I often plant when in a sandy, sandy soil without pre-irrigating. And it, and it works just fine. But if you're dealing with a situation where it's so loose that, that you're going to have a hard time controlling your depth, then it's, I, I think it's, it's, I think you have to pre-irrigate in that situation. Don, next question's for you. What are your thoughts on planting alfalfa in mid to late June after winter rye has been harvested for forage in the spring? Yeah, we can come back uh, in a late summer planting. Uh, again, I think you have to be aware of what uh, Kim talked about was that we need that uh, six to eight weeks before that uh, that killing frost of 26 degrees. But yeah, you can come back in later on and 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 plant uh, after another crop. Kim, this one's for you, and it was I think this was in reference to adding a little bit of nitrogen uh, to a seeding establishment alfalfa. The question reads exactly like this: Is 46 pounds parentheses 23 parts per million residual nitrogen too much? Is that in reference to a, an actual soil test of the nitrogen present in the soil? Well, I'm just taking it Not in sure, as yeah. the reader I, asked. I'm going to guess it, from the way that's that, asked that is what it is. Um, that's high, uh, but if that's the site you want to plant on, I wouldn't take the site out of consideration because of that. You just have to remember that the alfalfa is not going to fix its own nitrogen if it has enough available in the soil. So if you have residual nitrogen from a previous crop, you're not going to see the same rhizobial development that you would um, if you didn't have that much. Earl, we have our friend the dandelion and one of the audience members says, what's the best herbicide to use on those pesky buggers? Yeah, the, the, there are no herbicides that do a great job of controlling perennials in alfalfa. There are, the, the best that we have would be Velpar. Um, and, and I would classify that as good. It would often, you know, it'll turn it yellow. It'll often suppress seed head production. And so you don't see the seed head in the, in that, that first cutting, but, but it's still there if you look down in the canopy. So Velpar is probably your best bet. And unless you planted around a pretty alfalfa, that'll do a really nice job on it too. But I think the best rule of thumb for any perennial weed problem that you have in alfalfa, whether it's um, bindweed or dandelion or quack grass is to control your perennial weeds before you plant alfalfa because we have no good tools tools to control them. So this question here, um, maybe we'll send to Kim. How soon does autotoxicity happen? Can you thicken an alfalfa stand within the first month? So really what they're asking is when is the when does auto toxicity begin to kick in and you just you're you're done with planting alfalfa okay. until you have that break? Well that's that's an excellent question, actually. <laughs> I would like to know the answer to that myself. <laughs> so the rule of thumb that we typically tell people is that if you if you determine your stand is is a failure in the first year, you should be able to go back in and and thicken it with more alfalfa. Uh, because you haven't had enough time for autotoxicity to build up. But I'm just going to relay some anecdotal information on that, um, which is that I've seen 
far too many places where that failed also. So it kind of, you know, you have to ask the question of, well, if the first planting failed and then the second planting failed, you can't necessarily blame it only on autotoxicity because there could have been something else wrong with the site. Maybe the pH was too low or there was a disease problem or an insect or, or something. Um, but certainly auto, I'm a little bit suspicious that autotoxicity may kick in um, faster than we have given it credit for. But I'm working on a research project right now where we're trying to learn more about it. So maybe in a few years, we'll have answers to some of these things. Jim, we're uh, coming to the top of the hour here. Um, we're going to go a couple of minutes long just to try to clear the deck so we'll quicken the pace up even more. But I, this reader or viewer says, I seed alfalfa in soils that usually are between 7 and 7.5 pH. Is that too high? That should be fine. That's well within the tolerance for alfalfa. And that's pretty common out in some of the Western places. You don't have nearly as much trouble with acid soil out there as we do in, no. up here in the north. <laughs> Question for any of our audience, our, our experts here: Has anyone used a minimum till ripper in established in established alfalfa to help with compaction issues? And, and this person says, such as a Case IH 2500 eco till or a zone builder. Anyone want to tackle that one? No experience on that? I don't. Tried it. Well, this is Don. Like I think, <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, it's just whether the compaction is worse and what the damage would be to, to the alfalfa plants. You know, uh, you might be damaging some of those crowns and uh, you have a little bit more disease uh, entering into the plant. So, yeah. Another toss-up question. Has anyone used poultry manure or cattle manure on organic alfalfa? And I think this question comes in from somebody wanting to add nitrogen in an establishment. Any experience on that one? Well, we do apply, um, we do apply, manu I don't know about organic manure, but people do apply manure to alfalfa here in Michigan because we have to put our manure somewhere and alfalfa is a good place to put it. Um, and it will be, it will do great with manure. But again, the thing that you have to understand is that it will use that nitrogen first instead of fixing its own, which might not be a problem if you have a lot of manure and nitrogen that you need to get rid of. Um, alfalfa is an excellent sca scavenger for nitrogen. Um, and of course, it can use all the other nutrients in the manure as well. So, yeah, poultry manure has been used also, but it's a little bit hotter than, than what the other manure is. And the last question that we're going to take here, it just came in. Thoughts on dragging spring tooth harrows in the spring in an alfalfa field to knock down the gopher mounds? Anybody ever deal with pesky gophers or other critters that are making holes in alfalfa? fields all the time all the time and it and yeah it's a common practice just to to try to um level the field so if it, any of your trapping or, or poisoning efforts can are a little bit easier when you can see the fresh mounds a little bit easier so yeah it can be a common tool but but then again as don mentioned you you may be damaging some of the crowns providing entry points for disease and so it, it does have an effect on the on the stand in a in a negative manner, but sometimes it's worth it when we need to to try to knock down gopher mounts so they don't end up running through our swather. Yeah, and, and if you don't do that, um, you know, you may get a lot more ash in your your too. So <laughs> so you have soil added to the hay that you're harvesting. So yeah. And the last time I checked, uh, ruminants cannot digest ash very well. Uh, so it's now my pleasure to introduce the Agriculture's Brighter Side video contest. It just was announced earlier this morning at the Professional Dairy Producers of Wisconsin. Alflorex Seeds is launching a video contest to promote Agriculture's Brighter Side. And as Ron Cornish said earlier in our pre-broadcast, everything comes from the sun, all of our energy on planet Earth. So that's hence the brighter side. To enter the contest, go to www.agriculturesbrightersside.com and enter up to a three minute video showing how you use products produced by our hard working farmers across America and around the world. This first contest will run from April 1, 2021 to April 30th, 2021. The top three vote getters will get a 
receive a prize and will be recognized by Alphalark Seeds. Be creative and have fun with the contest. As a final reminder, thanks for listening our, to our Alpha live stream webcast. All participants will receive a survey at the conclusion of the webinar. Rank each of the questions from one to five with one being the lowest ranking. Boy, I hope we don't get many of those because we're trying really well. And five being the highest ranking. But be fair and honest because we do use this to improve our webcast. Did you find this webinar informative? Did the presenters provide useful information for your decision-making process? Was the webinar the appropriate length of time for the topic covered today? And anything else you'd like to share to improve the webinar format? Also, these webcasts are archived and they are placed on our YouTube channel and so they'll be available very shortly. On behalf of Ron Cornish, Don Miller, Kim Casada, and Earl Creech, I am Corey Geiger, your host of Alfalfa Livestream. Thank you for joining us and we wish you all a good day. Goodbye, everyone.